Governor Babagana Zulum of Borneo State has urged the federal government to hire mercenaries to end insurgency and he also laments Boko Haram members rejoining terrorist groups. And the former governor Peter Obi of Anambra State compares Nigeria to a vehicle with a knocked engine. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mariana Cole. The governor of Borneo State, chairman of the North Governors Forum, Baba Gana Zulum, has urged the federal government to hire mercenaries and collaborate with Nigeria's neighbors to end insurgency. He also lamented that the issue of de-radicalization of Boko Haram terrorists or the Safe Corridor Initiative has not worked in line with expectations. He said that no one, or he said that not only did some of the repentant Boko Haram terrorists go back to the insurgents after the de-radicalization program, they actually serve as informants to them. Well, to discuss this with me is retired Colonel Chinedu Ohonda and good governance advocate Shegun Shopitang. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. So, Shegun, I'm going to start with you. Um, the governor uh, of Borneo State is not only just talking about Boko Haram here, but he's saying that these people who we spent taxpayers' monies on, we de-radicalized and said that these people have to be reintegrated into society, have not only um, gone back to Boko Haram, but they have decided to also be giving them information. Um, so my question is, does this mean that this re de-radicalization program and this whole um, drama that the government put together is a failed thing? Hello. Um, well, okay, so the, the thing is, uh, first of all, I think it's important that uh, from a contextual point of view, we understand that the radicalization programs is not new. You know, it's not a new phenomenon. It's not a new strategy um, in fighting um, terrorism as a counter-terrorism strategy. Um, in fact, what you find if you look at other countries across the world that have struggled with terrorism um, over the last 10, 20, 30 years, what you find is that it has become clear that military um, action in terms of combat, you know, engagement alone can never um, overcome terrorism. Uh, especially terrorism that is ideology-based, right? So Boko Haram is clearly an ideological terrorist organization. Um, you, can't, you can't defeat them just by, by sheer force of power. You have to address the fundamental issues of ideas, the fundamental issues of the economics, you know, uh, poverty, education, and all of that. And, and I think that's where the, the radicalization is coming from, right? So now, Having said that, the challenge we have, and the reason I think that we're having, you know, we're struggling with, you know, these de-radicalized guys going back um, to work against the state is that we are not following the rules of engagement when it comes to de-radicalization programs. And what, the could, those, what, could, those, what could those rules active. be? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Explain to us what the rules uh, are, the ones that you're saying that we haven't followed. Yeah, so um, in Pakistan, for example, who have practiced, practiced de-radicalization in the past, um, Saudi Arabia, who has also done that, the, the, the strategy is, first of all, to identify people who have not been, um, who are not hard radicalized individuals, you know? So radicalization happens um, over a spectrum. It's a, like a range um, of uh, mindsets. You do, you, it, it's very difficult to de-radicalize a man who is on the field shooting people and killing people. Because to take another human life requires a certain level of, um, uh, your mind needs to be in a certain place. Once your mind is in that place, to bring that mind back, which is exactly what the radicalization is trying to do. You're trying to bring the mind of people back from the extreme, from the fringes of society into normal thinking again. A man who has taken up guns and bombs to kill innocent people, 
it's almost impossible to de-radicalize them. And I think that's where we're getting this wrong in that you can de-radicalize collaborators. You can de-radicalize uh, people that are in their logistics, uh, you know, supporting them with, with uh, food, supporting them with information and all that. But you, it's almost impossible to de-radicalize combatants. And I think that's where we're getting this wrong. So uh, I think with all due respect to the Nigerian army and, you know, the whole security forces, they need to look at this program carefully and apply it in accordance with best practice. What we're doing in Nigeria right now is far from being best practice. Okay, Colonel Honda, obviously this is your forte. You used to be a colonel in the Nigerian army. So I'm guessing that Shagun is speaking to you directly, saying this has gone about the wrong way. So I pose the same question. Does this mean that this was time wasted and taxpayers' monies wasted on a de-radicalization program that didn't work? Well, as a matter of fact, the, the army, or rather the military, Nigerian military, barely spent money, a whole lot of billions, spent time, spent all the resources available to make sure they de-radicalize these boys. It, it is not possible. Why is it not possible? Because these people have been used to a peculiar way of life. Killing, maiming, raping, causing all kinds of heinous crimes. And now the federal government of Nigeria decided to pay more attention to them with taxpayers' money. And leaving our soldiers that have been in the bush for long, all in the name of trying to say they are dis radicalizing these people and so on. It's not possible. They've gone back, they've gone back. Most of them have done joint banditry. Most of them, they are still into the same in your crime. So people should know, they should really know how, how to maintain and sustain our people and how to de-radicalize these things, because that one cannot work in any way. So as someone who has worked in the army, because you're saying that this, and, and I think you're saying the same thing that Shegun said, that you cannot really de-radicalize the ones who carry the guns. Um, so what should have been done in the stead of these de-radicalization de programs? Because Governor Zulum obviously has been um, crying about this for so long, I mean, for, for, I mean, this, what, this time, everybody has to listen because he's made a very serious case about these people becoming informants for Boko Haram. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, there have been cases where the army, even though it's not necessarily something they like to publicize, where there have been saboteurs, there have been people who have um, somewhat given information to these insurgents, and so, sometimes before the army gets there, you know, they either ambush them or, you know, they set traps for them. Could this also be as a result of these men who, again, in quotes, were de-radicalized, but they're still passing information to Boko Haram? He's saying that the product of Agama is Agama. Whether they de-radicalize them or not, they will go back and pass information sabotage the efforts of the government and so on. Even I heard that the Nigerian military wanted to recruit them into their fold. I'm sorry, they will useless that listen. And, and let me tell you, the truth of the fact is that this group of people that have been there are the ones that are still the bandits and the ones that are perpetrating all that in your tribes in the Northwest North Central and uh, Middle Belt of the country. So we should know that, look, these people are busy making money and they have agents. They have agents. And the government, governor saying, oh, they should see how they can get machineries and so on. If possible, Nigeria, even when during Jonathan's time, they used machineries and they, 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 they recovered over nine local governments out of 12. So what happened? You know, that Do, now Colonel, you are using... I'm, I'm sorry to come in there, uh, but this is a question I was meaning to ask you earlier on. 
Um, there used to be the use of mercenaries to deal with these insurgents and, of course, the issue of insecurity, but then it was stopped. So my question is, why was it stopped? Was it not working? If it was working indeed, as you are saying, why, aren't we, why didn't we continue with it? I mean, now we have our plates really, really full to the brim. Those group of this thing, the executive at com, they are very good. We, we use them in South Africa. We, no, we use them in, uh, they, they are South Africans. We use them in uh, Liberia and we use them in Sierra Leone, both for logistics, both for logistics. So, and if our people are yet, have, that have come out that they should use this voice, and this, I believe, I believe they will conquer this because, but the fear is for them coming is that a lot of leakages of information sabotage is taking place and that is why the people are even not, not wanting to come i, I want to dwell on this for a bit before i go back to shagun because you seem to have been on the field you have fought in many wars how can these leakages be plugged because if this is not done i mean you know that we're losing our men and we cannot afford to the nigerian army at some point used to be some one of the best if not in this part south part of the sahara but all of a sudden, it looks like that winning streak has been lost. Maybe it's due to these leakages. So how do we plug them? You can't totally block them. You can curtail. But totally blocking it, <laughs> I don't see it happening because some people are making money out of this. You so, know? so you're telling yeah. me that you're telling me that a soldier who swore an oath to protect and serve this country would rather be selling information that could make people lose their lives to a certain person. And the Nigerian army, as powerful as it is, cannot find these moles and deal decisively with them. Is that what you're telling me? They have seen, they have known those that are sabotaging, but nothing, nothing much has been done. They've not been caught much out openly and so on, and people made to know that they, they, they are passing information and so on. But they, mind you, these people are getting money, and the money is being passed through some Comprado Bujazis, government agents. So some of these uh, issues of people going to war and they are ambushing them, or they are telling them when to come and not, not to come and so on, is part of the problem the army is having. So <laughs> by the time you know what we are saying, They've ambushed, they've killed so many of our soldiers and officers. But this thing can be curtailed. If they catch anybody doing this, they can cut Masha or do something drastic to the place. But instead of keeping quiet and nothing is done and so on, our boys are wasting and dying on a daily basis. Hmm. Let me come back to Shegun. Shegun, uh, you are a good governance advocate, so one of the, your topmost priorities is to make sure that government is doing the right thing. Now, again, I, I'm, I'm continuously emphasizing on the fact that it's taxpayers' money so that we use to rehabilitate people who have been killing our people, people who have been terrorizing the state. We still paid for them to be rehabilitated and then again, they turn around and give information to the terrorists. What does this whole revelation by Governor Zulum um, say about our fight against insurgency and terrorism, being that this was one of Mr. President's number one ammunition for getting into office in 2015? Um, well, first of all, uh, with regards to the issue of the taxpayers' money, you know, and what it's costing us to fund this de-radicalization program, we have to re realize also that whatever option you adopt, you know, de-radicalization, like I said before, is a strategy. Whatever strategy you adopt will cost you money. Whether you're talking of just taking them on, you know, with sheer military might in combat, or you're talking of negotiation to try and stand them down, um, or you're talking of disarmament for the ones that are not completely radicalized yet, you're going to spend money. In fact, whether you're even talking of apprehending them and then taking them to court to try them, it's going to cost money, a lot of money, right? So the fund, the, the cost issue is something that we can't run away from. Um, to the other point that you raised about, you know, what, trying to determine what's wrong with, the, with our fight against insurgency, given, especially given 
the promises that were made by the president, you know, first in his first coming, in his first term, and then even re-emphasized again in the second term. Um, we've said consistently that we are getting certain things wrong in this fight. And I'll tell you one of the major issues that we have, Miriam. Um, there are certain things that we can't say on air <laughs> because, you know, this conversation is, a pub, is public and, you know, you, 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 you have access to certain types of information that you, you, you're, just, you're just reeling, you're shocked, right? The issue of corruption in Nigeria is creating more problems than we realize. This war on terrorism has lasted far longer than it should have at the scale it has lasted on or at because one of the major singular issues is corruption. Um, one might not be able to say more than that, right? There are things that are happening, um, you know, um, within uh, that ecosystem that is perpetuating this war, right? People have turned the war on terrorism into a business. Now, those people are people that cut right across the entire ecosystem. You can mention whichever um, stakeholder in that whole um, um, area. There are people involved in this. You know, the colonel mentioned the issue of leakages, for example, right? That's one problem. The other problem is that some members of the security services and forces um, appear, appear, right, to be profiting and benefiting from the perpetuation of this or perpetuation of this war. And you know, and this is really, really not necessarily a unique problem. It's it's all over the world. War is a business, right? So it is for our government to understand the fundamentals of, of this, this issue and tackle the root causes until we get the war against corruption right. We will continue to struggle in areas where we ought not to be struggling. So there ought to be consequences. Some of the things that we're talking about are not things that are secret, right? People in authority know about these things. People at the highest echelons of government or of the security services are aware of some of these things that we're alluding to, but there are no consequences yeah. because one way or the other in this government and probably in previous ones as well, in fact, certainly in previous ones as well, there are sacred cows. There are people you simply can't touch. And for as long as we have that situation, the war on terror will continue to falter. We have to grant, you know, on the one hand that yes, things might have improved. If you want to just look at the statistics and the sheer numbers, the sheer scale of what's going on, but then things have also metamorphosed. So you have combatants who are Boko Haram combatants who we now are beginning to realize are the so-called bandits <laughs> across the Northwest, are the so-called bandits that are terrorizing part of North Central, and I even begin to make incursions into the Southwest and probably some parts of the Southeast. So yes, there's been some sort of improvement and little wins here mm -hmm. and there for the military in the, in the core Northeast uh, uh, battlefront, but there is a metamorphosing of the whole nature of the terror problem in Nigeria, and it's spreading its tentacles and becoming more complex. Our government needs to be on top of all of this. The bandit issue was left to fester until it has gotten to a stage now where it has become a business and kidnaps are happening on a weekly basis and people are going to negotiate and plead with bandits who ordinarily we should have by sheer force of might, and we're talking of the might of the federal government of Nigeria, the biggest economy in Africa. You know, Nigeria is not a small country. It's not a small entity, right? Where is the force? Where is the power of that might to try to crush these forces? It's very, very surprising. So I think that our government, our federal government needs to do a whole lot more from the front, from the point of view of corruption and fighting corruption, and from the point of view of just uh, being on top of things in terms of strategy, in terms of intelligence and counterintelligence about what's going on. There's so much room for improvement. Um, things are, you know, and people who used to say, oh, it's the service chiefs that were the problem. Well, hello, the service chiefs are gone. And if anything, things have gotten worse. 
mm. in the last two months or three months since the service chiefs were changed. So it goes beyond just the people and the personalities in these positions to fundamental issues surrounding the core governance question in Nigeria. As long as you have bad governance, these types of outcomes are inevitable. So okay. uh, uh, at the end of the day, you know, one sounds like a broken record, but Nigerians simply need to rise up and understand that if we don't collectively fight against poor governance, we'll suffer the consequences in more ways than we realize or that we want. I would love to ask you another question, but I'll, I'll, I'll send this question, I'll direct it to Colonel Honda. You're saying that we need to rise up and fight for good governance. We did, Colonel. I'm sure that you remember October 20 of uh, 2020, and you saw what happened. You saw what happened uh, recently this year when people attempted again to ask for good governance, to ask for justice, to demand for the dividends of democracy. Um, they were shut down. You saw the might, that might that Shegu is asking for. We saw it here in Lagos. But unfortunately, um, Connor, we don't seem to see that might when it comes to fighting insurgency or banditry. We seem to pay a lot more lip service to the, those issues. And then we seem to unleash all the might of the government when protesters are, you know, coming out to ask for good governance and they're not armed, they're just peaceful protesters. Do you think that these bandits, these insurgents, these terrorists have taken advantage of the soft um, uh, strategy or rather the maybe no strategy that the government has um, provided to deal with them? Uh, the fact that they're even asking, they had the temerity to ask that um, the, the president of this country comes to dialogue with them before they can lay down their arms. Do you think that the government is appearing weak? to these people, hence the reason why they're coming out in their numbers with different names? Well, uh, to say that it's weak statement, the, the, the has held in so is that people perceive bad the situation and found out. First of all, that this who said it? Go take me. Connor, we're having a problem with hearing you. I think that your line is breaking. Are you, are you moving? Because we can't hear you very well. It's like Sokoto. When I go shape, go Okay, Connor, Connor, we'll have to call you back because we cannot hear you. So we're gonna do we're gonna try that again. But Shagun, I think I'm going to bounce this question back to you. When uh, the Connell returns, he will ask or uh, answer it. But um, do you in any way think that the soft spokenness or the no action from government or the idea that the government was not necessarily speaking up or acting on time in terms of the banditry and all of the terrorism that's been happening? These people may have taken advantage of it. Do you think that? No, absolutely. I mean, there is, there is, there is absolutely no doubt about it. You know, um, I mean, this is, it's, uh, it's almost shocking, you know, to find that as a people and as a country, we we are not playing by the simple rules that govern human behavior. If you want, the reason that there is something called. Um, capital punishment for children, for example, is to deter bad behavior. Mm -hmm. When a child behaves in a bad way, you smack him. You smack him, you know, whatever way. You know, we, we, we crack all those jokes about the types of slippers and the types of weapons that our mothers used on us when we were young, right? And the fear, the memory of that knock, that conk on your head or that slap to your face or the one that they give you at the back of your head, depending on the style that your parent prefers, the fear of that smack helps you to continue to behave well. You will remember when you've gone out of your house and you, you've gone out late, before you come back, you're already crying, you know, in anticipation of the smack that you're going to collect. You're giving me <laughs> so, bad memories of know, my childhood, I but to... I, I think the Colonel is back. <laughs> I don't want to remember these things. I was hit a lot. <laughs> um, Colonel Honda, yeah, we have you back. I would like for you to answer that question, please. Yeah, you see, in a situation where the government is not taking any proactive action, it's a problem. You have those.
that are dialoguing, negotiating with these people. They know their camps, and they have said that the military all know their camps and so on, and they couldn't raid the place. So which means that we are fighting a war that is in futility. Futility in the sense that this war cannot be won without the mind of the decision of the government, of the security agencies and so on, putting things together and make sure. And they will continue to, 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 to grab people, adopt them, negotiate for money, and carry the money to buy for arms. Why is it that these men are known? These bandits are known. Nobody has been arrested. Nobody uh, has been prosecuted. No person has been asked any question. They said, oh, they, we see them coming to market, market with, with slinging AK-47 and buying whatever they want, go back to this it, and we know their accounts and so on. Why can't the government read? Read the, 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 the locations of these people. But it is something that there is a high class collaboration high class collusion, high class cooperation between the cooperative and, 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 and these bandits wow. and the Boko Haram. Because we created it for ourselves. We created it. There is a video I've been watching since morning that has gone viral. They said they sat in their bush. They sat in their villages. Government brought arms to them. What do they expect them to use the arms for? Well, this, has, this, this, has, this, this is something that, that they, 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 they collaborate with high class of politicians and other uh, Unfortunately, uh, we're, we're out of time. I want to thank you very much, Kodal uh, Ohonda, for being part of this conversation. Shegu Shopitan, thank you, gentlemen. We're out of time. We thank need you. to go for a quick break. Thank you. When we come back from that break, we'll be looking into Dr. Peter Albee's comments on comparing Nigeria to a car with a knocked engine. We'll be right back. Stay with us.